thank you for that very warm, generous welcome. Um, I'd like to start just by paying tribute to the Gay and Lesbian Humanist Association and indeed to the British Humanist Association for the work they have done over many decades to support the LGBT communities. They have been there through every single battle. They are one of the longest uh, LGBT organisations uh, in existence in Britain. And they have stood with our community through good times and bad, through the points of victory, but also the setbacks and defeats. So my huge appreciation to everyone from GALA and the BHA for your work for LGBT human rights and indeed for human rights in general. Thank you. The title of tonight's talk is The Unfinished Battle for LGBT Human Rights. And that word unfinished sort of says it all. It implies both that progress and advances have been won, but there is still more to do. And before I focus on the more to do, I'd like to just take a pause and step back to recall what we have achieved. What we have achieved. Not me, you, and tens of thousands of other LGBT people and our straight friends and allies. And it has been a truly extraordinary, staggering record of achievement. As Adam just mentioned, in 1999, Britain had, by volume, the largest number of homophobic laws of any country on earth in history. Almost every aspect of gay life, particularly gay male life, was criminalised. Now, a lot of people think that everything changed in 1967. But that was just a partial, limited decriminalisation. And of course, decriminalization is not the same as legalization. In fact, after 1967, all the same homophobic laws that had existed for decades or even centuries remained on the statute books. The only thing that changed was that in certain narrow, limited circumstances, they were not enforced. People were no longer prosecuted but the laws remained on the statute books. And what many people, I'm surprised, do not recall or perhaps never knew, was that so many aspects of gay life were criminalised. It wasn't just the sexual act. You know, under Section 32 of the 1956 Sexual Offences Act, uh, the so-called crime of soliciting or importuning in a public place, which was originally introduced in the late 19th century to stop curb crawling and to protect young girls, that law, very soon afterwards, was almost exclusively used to harass, arrest, prosecute and convict, and sometimes jail, men for merely meeting each other in a public place with the intention of a sexual relationship. So what we popularly call as cruising, but even you know, exchanging names and phone numbers in the street or in a supermarket or the post office queue, these are public places and they were treated as the crime of soliciting and importuning and punishable by two years imprisonment. Now it's true that from the late 1980s, to the early 1990s, very few people were prosecuted, maybe only 100 or so a year, sometimes even less. And very few people actually went to prison. But that simple act of meeting in a public place, you know, was a crime. And men were prosecuted and convicted for things like repeatedly smiling or winking at other men in a public place, on the grounds that this was an attempt to solicit or importune a homosexual act. 
Think about it. Men arrested, taken to court and convicted for smiling or winking at other men on the street. You had to do it more than once. Twice was enough to secure a conviction. That was, that's the qualification of persistent. It was persistent soliciting or importuning in a public place. After the 1967 Act, it remained a criminal offence to facilitate, aid and abet, encourage or invite an act of homosexual anal intercourse. That remained a crime punishable by two years imprisonment. So, for example, if, as I often did, let some friends from Manchester come and stay in my living room and sleep overnight in the knowledge that they were gay and were likely to have gay sex, I was committing the criminal act of aiding and abetting homosexual intercourse, if indeed they had anal sex. Moreover, they were committing the crime of committing a homosexual act in a non-private place because I was in the bedroom while they were having sex. Under the 1967 Act, homosexual relations were only lawful if both men were aged 21 or over, whereas the age of consent for heterosexual sex was 16, and if the sexual act took place with consent and in the privacy of the person's own home, with doors and windows locked, <laughs> curtains drawn, and no other person present in any other part of the house. In addition, um, you know, there were many, many cases, I'm sure some of you may recall, of men who were arrested for videos uh, where they were having sex on the assumption the camera was moving so there must have been a third person present taking the videos which meant that the three people were in breach of the privacy laws and although very rarely did the people captured on video dub in the person who was doing the filming they themselves were sometimes arrested, prosecuted and convicted. Um, I could go on and on. We should remember, 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 the criminalization of homosexuality in Britain was only finally ended in 2003. So when we point the finger at all these other countries around the world who are doing horrible, ghastly things to LGBT people, we're right to call them out but we should never forget that we only finally ended the criminalization of sex between men in 2003. That was the year that finally the buggery law, the law prohibiting anal sex, passed in 1533 in the reign of King Henry VIII. Finally, in 2003, it was repealed. You all know the story of Oscar Wilde, who was sent to prison for two years' hard labour for gross indecency in 1895. That law, likewise, was only repealed in 2003. Many of you remember the cases of gay men like the Bolton Seven, who were arrested for sex involving men with more than two partners. Never an offence between heterosexual men and women. Have as many partners as you like. Have group orgies, group sex, fine, if you're straight. But for gay men, that prohibition was only finally repealed in 2003. And as a result of a legal case brought by some of the Bolton Seven who were convicted in 1999. Or 1998. 1998. Um, it was only thanks to them taking our government to court that that law was finally uh, abolished in 2003. So, it is recent history, just nine years ago, that we, for the first time in this country, had a penal code 
that did not discriminate on the grounds of sexual orientation. A very, very recent phenomenon. And of course, that process of change was allied to many other law reforms. Um, the great cycle of reform began, of course, in 1999, when the European Court ruled that the ban on lesbian and gay people in the armed forces was unlawful. And the government then changed the regulations to allow people who are lesbian, gay or bisexual to serve in the armed forces uh, without discrimination. That was the first law reform in 1999. Then there followed eventually the equalization of the age of consent, um, the uh, abolition of Section 28, then came the right of same-sex couples to foster and adopt children, civil partnerships, protection against discrimination based on sexual orientation in the workplace, and then more recently the laws to outlaw all other forms of discrimination based on sexual orientation in housing, education, and the provision of goods and services. All this has happened within the mere space of just over one decade. In one decade, all these historic laws and discriminations have been repealed. That has got to be the fastest, most successful law reform campaign in British history. And that's a huge tribute to all of you and the many, many other LGBT people and straight friends who have marched protested, lobbied, and demanded justice and equality. You, we, have collectively brought our community to a place where we've gone from being the country with the largest number of homophobic laws to a country which ranks among the best in terms of LGBT human rights. All in the space of just one decade. An extraordinary, remarkable achievement. And we should all be mighty, mighty proud. And as we look forward to the battles yet to win, just take a step back and look at where we have come from. Look at when I was growing up gay in the 1960s, when homosexuality was still defined as an illness, a sickness. The Medical Association, the British Medical Association, said we were sick. The forerunner of the Royal College of Psychiatrists said we were mentally ill. Right up into the 1970s, gay and bisexual men were being subjected, either by pressure or sometimes by court order, to electric shock aversion therapy to cure their homosexuality. And for those who don't know, you know, people would be put in a chair, strapped with electrodes, and then shown gay erotic images, and then given electric shocks, or sometimes nausea-inducing drugs that would make them vomit. The idea was to associate homosexuality with pain, displeasure, discomfort, to thereby, thereby change someone's sexual orientation. Of course, it didn't work. It did not work. I know some men who went through that process, and they all say it didn't change them it just destroyed their libido, their erectile function, and their emotions. They ended up basically asexual vegetables, most of them. You know, sexually and emotionally destroyed. And, you know, this echoes very much the Nazi program for the eradication of homosexuality. How ironic that we were fighting a war against fascism to defeat the authoritarianism of the Nazis, who were also doing experiments on lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people to cure their sexual orientation and gender identity. You know, that, that famous doctor that I helped expose, that Nazi doctor, Karl Wernet, who experimented on gay prisoners in Buchenwald and Neuengamme concentration camps, he was also searching and using, he was basically using hormone, what he called hormone therapy, he put hormone implants in people's bodies. And yet, after the war, 
in Britain on the National Health Service at taxpayers' expense, gay and bisexual men were being subjected to electric shock and nausea-inducing therapies to also eradicate their homosexual desires. And I remember in 1992, sorry, 1972, in 1972, I remember going to a lecture by Professor Hans Eysenck, in those days probably the world's most famous esteemed psychologist, where he openly advocated electric shock and nausea-inducing therapies to cure homosexuality. And he was lauded for it. He was regarded as the expert, the person who should be listened to. I also remember finding out and helping expose the fact that at least one gay man died, died, was killed by doctors who subjected him to these therapies. And those doctors have never ever been either struck off by the GMC or put on trial for manslaughter. Because that's what they did. They may not have intended to kill him, but that reckless use of those barbaric therapies surely rank as manslaughter in the case of that man's death. So you can see that we have made great progress. We have moved a long, long, long way. And it is, I say again, a great tribute to everyone, every single person who's ever written a letter, lobbied their member of parliament, marched in the streets. Whatever people have done, however big or small, the cumulative collective effort has brought us, brought us to this greater place of freedom and equality today. As I said, there is unfinished business. We ain't quite there yet. And that's what I want to talk about because I think it's easy when you think about the harshness and extreme prejudice of the past to think that everything's now fine. To think that the rights and freedoms of LGBT people are secure. But there is unfinished business. And of course, one of the main areas of unfinished business is the ongoing ban on same-sex civil marriage. Now, I am not a great fan of marriage personally. You know, I tend to share the feminist critique that marriage has a long patriarchal sexist history. You know, just the terms husband and wife, an alternative meaning of the word husband is to manage and control, which is exactly the way throughout history men have tended to treat their wives manage and control them. Um, you see it in the tradition of the father of the bride giving away his daughter to the husband-to-be. It's the symbolic passing of woman from one man to another. Now, I don't like that. I don't like that. But I, as a Democrat, will absolutely defend the right of other people to make that choice if they're so misguided. <laughs> it's their choice. It's their choice. Uh, moreover, I resent the fact that the law states that I don't have an option, that I don't have the choice whether to get married or not get married. I want marriage equality so I can make the choice to not get married. <laughs> I don't want to be told by the state that I'm barred I want that to be my free choice. Many people, of course, say that we've got civil partnerships, what's the fuss about? And I accept that civil partnerships are an important, valuable advance. They have redressed many of the grave injustices faced by same-sex couples in long-term relationships where there was no legal recognition or rights. So in that sense, they are an important advance. But of course, they are a separate system. And separate is not equal. You know, in the days of apartheid in South Africa, they had a legal segregation, separation. One set of laws for black people, another set of laws for white people. 
It's what they call apartheid, separate, apart. And although the ban on same-sex marriage does not involve any of the gross brutalities and tortures that accompany apartheid, in the legal sense of segregation in law, we do have a similar system in that same-sex couples are banned from civil marriages and opposite-sex couples are banned from civil partnerships. I don't know about you, but for me, one of the fundamental principles of a democratic society is that we should all be equal before the law. You know, there should no be, be no separation. We would never, the majority of people in this country, would never accept if the government said to the black or Jewish communities, you are banned from marriage, but we will give you civil partnerships instead. That would be racist. That would be analogous to apartheid. People would be in uproar. Indeed, if we had that system, there'd be an international campaign to isolate Britain, to sanction us, to boycott us, to protest against us, because we were treating black and Jewish people in this way. Well, that's sort of the way I feel about the ban on same-sex marriage. It's a form of institutional discrimination that strikes at the very core and heart of who we are. It's a fundamental attack on our sexual, emotional, and affectionate lives. And we must resist it, even if we ourselves may not wish to get married. So that's, that's one issue which is unfinished. And although the government has said, to its credit, and I've got to say this as someone who's not a great supporter of the Conservatives or the Liberal Democrats, to its credit, the coalition government is committed and so far has withstood all the threats and all the bullying against it. To its credit, it's sticking with the promise to legalise marriage equality by 2015. We have to make sure they hold to that pledge. So far they are. No sign of wavering right now. But we also need to ask the question, if we truly believe in equality, shouldn't we also stand for the rights of straight couples to have a civil partnership if they wish? If we just go for the issue of equal marriage for same-sex couples, we are not true Democrats and not truly standing by the principle of equality. I think we have to say very clearly that equality has to be for all, not just our community. And that means the right of straight couples, if they wish, to have a civil partnership. Now some people may say, well, would any straight person want to have a civil partnership? Good point. But when I go around the country, speaking about this issue, I find that time and time again, quite a lot of straight couples say that if they had a choice, they would prefer to have a civil partnership. Particularly among women influenced by feminist ideas. They prefer it as an alternative to marriage. Because in a civil partnership, you're both civil partners. None of this husband and wife stuff. It's much more equal, egalitarian. Um, if we look at the example of the Netherlands, for the last decade, the Dutch people have had a free and equal choice, civil marriage or civil partnerships. Initially, of course, before they legislated marriage equality, the Dutch introduced registered partnerships for same-sex couples. And these were designed and intended for same-sex couples, but they never had an exclusion against straits. What's happened in the last decade is suddenly, over time, the vast majority, two-thirds of all civil partnerships in the Netherlands, are now between heterosexual men and women. Women, in particular, have made that choice. They don't want marriage, they want civil partnerships. And I think that if we introduced civil partnership equality, we would find that over time, a growing number of straight couples would prefer that option. Even if it's only a tiny minority, the principle of equality is there. If we truly believe in equality, 
It has to be equality for gay and straight. But under the current system of the government, if they get their way, gay people will have two choices, civil partnerships or a civil marriage, whereas straight couples will only have one choice, a civil marriage. And that, my friends, is not fair. So we have to stand for the principle. The other big failing that appears to be on the cards is that the government is not going to lift the ban on religious organisations that want to conduct same-sex marriages. So, for example, the Quakers, the Unitarians, Liberal Judaism, and the Metropolitan Community Church all would like to enact same-sex religious marriages for people who worship with them. But currently, under the law, they're banned. And the government so far has indicated it intends to keep it that way. Now that to me is not only homophobic, but it's also an attack upon religious freedom and a compulsion on religion to discriminate. It's saying to these churches and synagogues that want to conduct religious same-sex marriages, no you can't, you must discriminate, you must not allow same-sex couples to have a religious ceremony in your place of worship. So that's an attack upon religious freedom and a compulsion on religious bodies to discriminate even if they don't want to. So I would urge all of you to write to your MP, write to the Prime Minister, write to the new minister in charge of marriage equality, Maria Miller, to express the wish that not only should there be the right of same-sex couples to have a civil marriage if they wish, but also the right of opposite-sex couples to have a civil partnership, if that's their preference, and equally the right of religious organisations to conduct religious same-sex marriages if they wish to do so. It's really important that we hold the flag for equality. It has been the mantra of our community and movement we must not let it drop on this issue. Another big issue or question we face is, of course, the appalling mistreatment of LGBT asylum seekers. Fleeing countries where they face homophobic and transphobic persecution. Uh, not merely the criminalisation of same-sex relations uh, and the threat of imprisonment, and in a few countries even the threat of execution, but mob violence, honour killings by family members, um, and a whole range of other uh, violent and threatening and menacing uh, pressures upon them. Those people come here to seek a safe haven under the Refugee Convention, which Britain has signed and pledged to uphold. And under that convention, we are duty-bound to give a safe haven to anyone who has a well-founded fear of persecution, on any grounds, political, religious, sexuality, gender, you name it. There are no qualifications, no exclusions. The Refugee Convention guarantees that safe haven to everyone. And no one, of course, is saying that anybody should be able to turn up on you know, an airport or seaport and just claim they're gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender and get asylum, of course they have to prove and provide the evidence. The problem is, they do and they're still rejected. The vast majority of LGBT asylum seekers are failed on their first application. Even if they have corroborating evidence to substantiate their claim of a well-founded fear of persecution. If they're fleeing a country like Iran, which has flogging and even the death penalty for same-sex relations, there are Iranian LGBT refugees who are being refused. Um, the same goes with people fleeing persecution in Uganda, Nigeria, Jamaica, Saudi Arabia. The list is endless. The government, I'm sad to say, driven by the Daily Mail and other right-wing forces, in our society, has an agenda about cutting asylum numbers. The priority for the government is to cut the numbers being granted asylum. And to be honest, 
they don't really care about the individuals or the merits of particular cases. They just want the numbers cut. So the whole asylum system is rigged, and I mean rigged, to fail as many refugees as possible. And it starts from the very beginning. First of all, some refugees are put into asylum detention centres and put on what's called fast track. It gives them about 14 days to prepare a claim for asylum. Now, if you don't speak any English, or very little English, if you don't know your rights and responsibilities, if you haven't already got a solicitor, the 14 days is gone, in many cases, before you can barely open your mouth. So, of course, very few people put in fast track are going to be able to gather the evidence, the proof, to substantiate their claim. You know, you need things like medical evidence of torture. You know, you need to therefore get a, a certified doctor to be able to examine you and to write a report. Now, you need to get an expert witness who has knowledge of the country you have fled from who can testify about the scale of homophobia and transphobia in that country. And that takes time to find the expert witness and to get him or her to write the documentation. So that's, that, that's one failing. The other failing is, even if you're not put into fast track, the government, beginning with the Labour government, and made worse by the present Conservative government, the government has, over the years, cut the amount of legal aid available for asylum cases. Um, so it means that no solicitor can possibly prepare a full authoritative asylum claim based on the negligible amounts of money that are available. There isn't enough to do a proper interview and take a proper statement, get witness statements, get newspaper and press reports, reports from human rights organisations, medical evidence, uh, police custody records in the home country. All these things cost money. It can't be done on the way in which the asylum legal aid budget has been cut. And of course, most people seeking asylum are poor, vulnerable people, or may, may have been rich people, but they had to leave all the riches behind. They've come here penniless, and mostly in nothing more than the clothes they're standing up in. For them, it's very, very, very hard to prove a legitimate case for asylum with the money and in the time span allocated. And it's, the system is rigged in that way precisely to fail as many people as possible to cut the asylum numbers to satisfy the right-wing MPs and the right-wing tableau. Um, we really do have to search our conscience as a nation that we are treating vulnerable people in this way. These people come often having escaped prison and they arrive here and they're stuck in an asylum dissension centre, which in effect is little more than a glorified prison. We compound the trauma they've gone through. And in these asylum detention centres, sometimes LGBT people are subjected to gross abuse, threats and even violence. Although the staff of the detention centres would claim they would never permit it, it goes on. And too often the victims are not given adequate protection. So, when it comes to asylum, there are big, big problems. Fortunately, we've had one important victory. Until a couple of years ago, the favourite tactic of the Home Office and UK Border Agency was to say to an LGBT refugee, well, you know, that they might even go as far as accepting, yes, you have been persecuted. Yes, you have suffered discrimination. Yes, your life has been threatened. You, you were attacked and physically assaulted. You were gang raped. You were tortured. We accept this. But we believe that it would be safe for you to go back to your home country if you behave with discretion. And what did this mean? Well, it meant different things to different asylum adjudicators, but some would say... Well, look, if you go back to your home country and change your name, if you move to a different part of the country where no one knows you, and if you stop having gay sex, no one will know you're gay, therefore you won't be persecuted. 
they would never say that to a political, ethnic, or religious refugee. Never. But they got away with it for years with LGBT refugees. Since then, in the last couple of years, the courts have ruled that that's illegal. That is not a legitimate, reasonable thing to demand of a person, to give up their identity, to go through all those incredible uh, changes and um, discretion. So what's increasingly happening is that the courts are disbelieving that people are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. They're saying to a very pretty, petite, feminine woman, you don't look like a lesbian. Or to a macho gay man, you don't seem gay to me. These words have actually been expressed, not very often, but they have been expressed by Home Office barristers and by asylum adjudicators. And if not expressed, you can see in the body language and the tenor and tone of the judgments that this is partly the reason for the refusal. It's that people don't fit the gay stereotype. It's particularly acute for lesbian refugees because if they've been married, and especially if they've had children, this is counted against them. Completely ignoring the fact that in so many cultures, women, all women, are under huge family, religious, and community pressure to marry. And likewise, it applies to lesbians. Many lesbians just don't feel they have a choice. In fact, they feel that getting married is the only way to deflect suspicion from their sexuality and to protect themselves from possible honor killing. So they get married, they put up with sex with men, they have children, and then eventually they find a way of escaping, and they come here, and their history of marriage and childbirth is used against them. There have been some recent cases of a gay Nigerian man who had evidence from former partners that he was gay, that they had relationships with him. The judge said he didn't believe this person was gay. Well, how is this man supposed to prove he's gay if ex-partners, credible, you know, authoritative, reliable individuals make statements, all of which chime together, if they're disbelieved, how is this person supposed to prove that he is gay? Likewise, a lesbian woman was recently deported back to Cameroon, a country gripped by a savage and brutal and tyrannical government that is persecuting LGBT people. Recently, a, a, a young man uh, has just finished a one-year jail sentence for texting a message that he loves someone. One year's jail for a text message. Unbelievable. And although lesbians are less persecuted in Cameroon, there is still a homophobic which, which does impact upon lesbians as well. But this young woman was sent back despite testimonial evidence from her partner that they were in a long-term, loving, same-sex relationship. So this is a real, real problem. And some of you may have known that recently I've been kicking up a fuss about this. And to the government's credit, let's give them the benefit of the doubt, um, they are going to do a further review. And uh, myself and others will be going in to meet um, government officials, and particularly officials from the UK Border Agency, to make a new assessment of their criterion and guidelines <laughs> for asylum caseworkers and for asylum adjudicators and for Home Office barristers who handle asylum cases. I don't know whether this will get a result, but there are people in Nick Clegg's office who seem quite genuinely horrified that these kind of cases are happening. So let's hope that their horror manifests in some real change. Another issue is, of course, the fact that we have what is basically a pretty good set of equality laws now. You know, we've got the law prohibiting 
sexual orientation discrimination in the workplace. We've got the law prohibiting sexual orientation discrimination in the provision of goods and services. And we've got the Equality Act 2010. Great. The only problem is that all these equality laws have written into them, albeit limited and qualified, but exemptions for religious organisations. Not merely churches, synagogues, mosques and temples, but faith-run schools, hospitals, nursing homes, hospices. They have the qualified right to discriminate against an LGBT person if it is deemed to conflict with their religious ethos. Now we know what the religious or organizations have in terms of their religious ethos, although most people of faith probably don't entirely agree with uh, some of this ethos, this is the official body, the authority of the church, the mosque, the synagogue and so on. And it is hostile and non-accepting of LGBT people. So this means that potentially an LGBT person could be refused to be employed in a faith-run institution, could be sacked from working in a faith-run institution, or could be denied service as a client of a faith-administered institution. If you look at the Equality Act 2010, which is, to me, a great triumph, I remember back in the 1980s when I stood as a Labour candidate in Bermondsey, um, one of my great policy ideas was to argue for a single, unified, equal rights act which would guarantee equal treatment and non-discrimination to everyone. So instead of having this hodgepodge of different laws on race, gender, disability, belief and so on, we'd have just one single act that would protect everybody against all forms of discrimination. Well, it took, you know, almost 30 years, but we got it in the Equality Act 2010. The problem is that even there it's written in these exemptions. You know, the clauses on harassment, protecting people against harassment, explicitly exclude harassment based on sexual orientation and gender identity. This was agreed and approved by the Labour government with the approval of Stonewall, the main LGBT rights group. They went along with this exemption. Stonewall and the Labour government argued, oh, we don't really need to include LGBT people in this section because they're covered by other anti-harassment laws. But if that's true, why were all the other groups included in this section on harassment? If there are other general anti-harassment laws that do protect everyone, why did they need to have you know, har protection against harassment based on race and gender written into that law? You know, quite shocking, quite shocking. In the section on schools, in the section on education, written in is the right of faith schools to discriminate on the grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity. So, you know, we have some fantastic laws, but they are well short of perfection and do not give us the full protection that everyone else enjoys. It's only LGBT people who are excluded from these provisions. Quite clearly, a deliberate, calculated attempt by the Labour government, supported by the Conservative Party, to appease religious bigots and intolerance. So that's more unfinished business. We also have the question of the way in which the law may be equal in theory and fact, but it's often not interpreted that way. So, for example, in this country we have very strong laws against incitement to violence. You know, the law explicitly prohibits any incitement, threat or menace of violence. When Sheikh Abdullah al-Faisal 
urged followers, or the Muslim community in general, to rise up and murder Jews and Hindus, he was promptly arrested, taken to court, convicted, and jailed for nine years. Actually, in my view, a slightly excessive sentence, which was eventually reduced to seven years on appeal. Nevertheless, he was convicted and jailed because the court determined that nobody, in this particular instance, Jewish and Hindu people, should not be subjected to these threats and menaces to kill them. Soon afterwards, in East London, Imam Abdul Muhid urged people to go out and kill homosexuals. There were, I think, four witnesses who were prepared to testify in court that he had said these things, not once or twice, but on many occasions. Do you know that imam was not even taken to court, let alone prosecuted and convicted? Not even taken to court. There's double standards for you. Likewise, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the eight Jamaican reggae and dancehall singers like Beanie Man, Bruja Banton, Bounty Killer, Elephant Man, and so on, who put out tracks openly encouraging, glorifying, and inciting the murder of LGBT people. The shooting, burning, hanging, and drowning of LGBT people. Bruja Banton's song, Boom Bye Bye, is of course the classic example where he exhorts people to get a gun, shoot a queer in the head, pour acid over his body, and burn him alive. This is gross incitement and solicitation to murder. A very, very serious criminal offence. None of those murder music singers, that's what it is, murder music, none of those murder music singers has ever been arrested, let alone prosecuted, even though, were, until, even though the, for, for many years they were able to perform and did perform these songs in this country. The BBC played those songs for years until we shamed and embarrassed them and forced them to stop, claiming it was free speech. You can bet there'd be no free speech if someone was advocating the killing of Jewish, Muslim or black people. I know because many years ago, in Waterloo, near where I live, the neo-Nazi band Screwdriver was planning to hold a concert. And they have a long history of racism. Um, I and others complained to the police, and the police immediately stepped in to stop their concert. They didn't even question whether they'd perform racist songs, let alone songs that advocate violence. They just said, this band has a history of racism. It is not conducive to good community relations. We are not allowing them to perform. This concert is banned. What did they do in the case of the murder music singers? The police protected them, protected their concerts, allowed the concert to go ahead and ring them with the police to protect against gay rights protesters. What madness has possessed those police that allowed them to do that? It shows that there are real double standards in the way in which the law is enforced. And that sometimes, I'm not saying every time, but sometimes we do not get the equal treatment and protection of the law to which we are entitled. And so often you hear these examples of the police, you know, pussyfooting around saying, oh, we don't want to do this, any action, because it might offend the Muslim community or it might affect the black community. I mean, hang on. Some of the main victims of this murder music are black, lesbian, and gay people. Some of the main victims of incitements to murder within the Muslim community are Muslim LGBT people. By not prosecuting, the police are betraying those vulnerable people in our minority communities who are entitled to exactly the same protection as anyone else. It's also based on some really big prejudiced, stereotyped assumptions. I can remember 
time and time again, when the police have said privately, not for repetition, not for public consumption, that they didn't want to take action against the murder music singers because it could provoke and upset the black community. The assumption there was that the black community is, as a whole, homophobic and supports the murder of other human beings who happen to be LGBT. I do not believe that for one moment. Of course, there are homophobic people in the black community, like there is in every community. But to make that gross generalization is, frankly, racist. Likewise with the Muslim community. You know, there are issues about homophobia and misogyny within the Muslim community. But to blanket and generalize about all Muslim people in this way is absolutely wrong and factually incorrect. You know, there are Muslim people who have taken a stand against homophobia and transphobia. And privately, there are many Muslim people who perhaps were not brave enough to say so, but personally, they share their opposition to homophobia and to incitements to violence by some extremists. So the police, I think, are really doing themselves, us and minority communities, a disservice when they treat uh, these cases in the way they do. The final example I want to just perhaps address is the whole issue of homophobic bullying in schools. We call it homophobic bullying, but if it was taking place outside of a classroom or school playground, it would be a serious public order or criminal offence. You know, if what is happening in some of our school playgrounds and classrooms was happening in the street, in an office, the people concerned would be arrested and charged with harassment, public order offences, and so on. Calling it bullying sort of devalues its seriousness or undermines the gravity of what is actually involved. The real damage psychological, emotional, and sometimes physical in the case of violence done to LGBT kids or to those who are perceived to be LGBT. Because I know of many instances where people have been beaten up or threatened with violence in their school on the assumption that they were gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. When in fact they weren't. They were just maybe a little bit effeminate in the case of a man, or a bit butch in the case of a woman. So, when it comes to homophobic bullying, I think we need a much tougher, stronger stance. And the proof of that is, of course, in the statistics. At least half and up to two-thirds of all young LGBT kids say that they have suffered abuse, threats, and sometimes actual physical assaults in their school, classroom, or playground. That is truly shocking. Truly shocking. Two-thirds. Half, one half to two-thirds. So often schools do very little about it. Some schools are fantastic. Some schools are absolutely brilliant. They will take a strong line. They will deal with the perpetrators. But many schools don't. And it's very interesting that... Some evidence suggests that most or the highest level of homophobic bullying takes place in faith schools, and it's these faith schools who are the least likely to take action against it. Even today, despite the consciousness about homophobic bullying, only about half of schools in Britain have anti-bullying programs that specifically address homophobic and transphobic bullying. Well, homophobic bullying, hardly any address transphobic bullying. Um, that really is a failure, a massive failure.